Income tax 2022-2023 Makers Depreciation Tax Software Examples. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, starting point, single filer, Mr. Anderson, living in Beverly Hills, 90210. No W-2 income, but instead we have the Schedule C business income flowing in. Let's recap that flow process. We got the Schedule C, which is the profit or loss from business and income statement format. Income minus expenses, the net income then flowing into the Schedule 1. On line 3, business income, which flows into the Form 1040 on line number 8. We also know that there's going to be self-employment tax, which flows from the Schedule C. The net income, 100000 in this case, is going to then be flowing to the Schedule SE, self-employment tax, used to calculate the self-employment tax at 14129 in this case, which flows to Schedule 2. So if we go to Schedule 2, 14129, line 4, part 2, which flows to the 1040, page number 2, not the income tax, but the self-employment tax. We also know half of that is going to be an above-the-line deduction adjustment to income. That's shown by the flow from the Schedule C, bottom line, which flows into the Schedule SE, bottom Schedule SE is the 14129, half of that. 7065 and above the line deduction which flows into schedule 1 page number 2 7065 which flows into the form 1040 and there's the above the line deduction 7065 getting us to the AGI 92936 then we have the standard deduction at the 12950 which is standard and then we've got the uh, Qualified Business Income Deduction, Form 8995. This worksheet shows the calculation. I'm not going to dive into that in detail because our focus is on the depreciation. But that gets us to our taxable income. Tax calculated on page 2 plus the self-employment tax minus any payments that we made gets us to the overpayment in this case. Okay, our main focus here is on, of course, the Schedule C and the depreciation are related to it. So if I go back to the Schedule C, we note that we have an income statement here. Let's get rid of some of these check marks. We've got an income statement and we're focusing in here on uh, the depreciation. So focusing right there on the depreciation. So when we buy equipment, for example, the question that often comes up is, can I just expense what I purchase, which means it might be like supplies or something, or do I have to put it on the books as an asset? And if you have to put it on the books as an asset, then you might have to depreciate it over uh, the useful life of the asset is the general rule. Although you might also be able to still basically depreciate it in year one if you get access to the 179 or bonus special depreciation, which we'll talk more about uh, in future presentations. Our major focus here is to get an understanding of the underlying maker's depreciation methods. And then you can kind of tack on the bonus depreciation concepts on top of that. So remember the general idea is that the, the, the accounting for the taxes is similar in nature with depreciation to what you have for normal uh, accrual accounting concepts, generally accepted accounting concepts in that if it's, if it's over a certain dollar amount, you wanna have a matching principle and therefore you wanna have to put it on the books as an asset instead of expensing it, even if you're on a cash-based system, because there's such a big difference between the time that you actually use what you purchased in order to generate revenue that we have to deviate from that cash-based system. That's the general idea. And that lines up with the general bookkeeping idea of an accrual concept. But then you might want to front load the depreciation with an accelerated depreciation, like a double declining balance, which still kind of lines up to normal accounting because 
you, you might, for example, use machinery more in the first years than the latter years. So you might want to think that it makes sense to get more depreciation in the first years than the latter years. But then it totally deviates from bookkeeping principles with the 179 and special depreciation kind of items, which are designed to kind of stimulate the economy uh, type, of, type of deductions. So now we're left with this weird situation where you might have things that you would have been able to expense on a cash-based system, but you made, they made you do an accrual thing, putting them, books, putting them on the books as an asset, but then they, then they turn around and still give you the expense up front as if you just wrote them off up front as an expense by giving you the 179 and special depreciation deductions. But those things could change you know, in the future, are more likely to change. And the thing that seems stable is you're always gonna have the underlying depreciation concepts, which are basically the maker's depreciation tables at this time, which line up to normal depreciation concepts. And then they would fluctuate, you would think, 179 in special depreciation, depending on the politics and on the economy. So that's the general idea. So if I determined that something that needed to be depreciated, then I can consider the lives of the depreciation. And you'll recall from prior presentations that usually we're going to be using the GDS, uh, and that's usually going to provide us with the double declining kind of method. And we have the, the normal categories are the, are the three, five, and seven year are often the common categories for, you know, like most of the things that are on there. And then we can elect if we want to move from a double declining to like uh, a 150 or a straight line, which we would only do on kind of unusual situations where we want to take more depreciation like in future periods. So let's put on a piece of equipment and just check this out. So I'm going to call it equipment one. Now notice when I put equipment on here, I'm going to be quite generic, but in practice you want to be quite specific because as these depreciation tables get longer, then you want to be able to actually assign what's on the depreciation schedule to what's on your books so that if you dispose of something, you can determine which thing you disposed of and handle it properly on the depreciation schedules. So I'm going to say this is going to go to, to the form schedule C. We're going to say it's going to be a category. Let's say it's going to be, uh, let's say it's, it's going to be machinery and equipment, date placed in service. Let's say it's 020222. Tax year 2022 is where we're at. So it's in February of 2022. Let's say the cost of it was 10,000 for an even number. And then we've got the 179 uh, deductions. Do we have any 179? I'm going to remove the 179. Uh, well, let's, let's keep the 179 for now so you can see the default. And then we'll talk more about 179 and special depreciations later. I'm going to say the method then for the machinery. Notice this kind of lists out the software in a similar fashion as the table. So once I get a general idea of the depreciation methods that apply, the software will kind of help me out to figure out the depreciation that I need to be taking. And so I'm gonna say that this is going to be then, we're gonna go with the five-year office equipment uh, here. Now notice with the five years, you've got all these different items because you could go to straight line, which is still makers. And, and then we could switch over to auto and, and so on with these other kind of restrictions. But we're gonna say it's not an auto, it's gonna be, I'm gonna to try to use the normal makers, which would, would be the double declining half uh, year. Okay, so I'm not gonna do anything to the prior uh, section 179 or the special. Let's just check that out and see what it does right now. So we've got the 10,000 that pulled in over here. If I look at the depreciation schedules, you can see that that it basically defaulted to be able to take the special depreciation, which is that big lump sum. So that's where it looks kind of funny where, you, where, where oftentimes you're saying, well, why did they force me to put it on the books as an asset if you're still just going to let me expense the entire thing in year one? Well, that's because they did the special depreciation and the 179 type of thing. Let's remove that so that we get to the normal maker's depreciation without the special depreciation. So now if I go back on over, we can see the calculation of uh, the equipment and I'll go to the, I know this one's small, we'll zoom in hopefully to, so we can see this one, but it's easier to see the full thing here. So the acquisition date, uh, the cost is 10,000. 
Notice what it says here, 200 DB, that's double declining balance, so 200 double declining half year convention, meaning it's gonna assume we purchased it in the middle of the year, even though I purchased it in February to do the calculation. So if you did, so if I did this calculation, you might think, hey, this looks like straight line depreciation, because I might say 10,000 divided by five is 2,000. But it's not straight line, it's double declining half year convention. So that's where it gets a little bit messy on that first year because it's really gonna be, it's gonna be like if I figured the, the, the rate, it would be 10,000 divided by five. And if I take that divided by the original 10,000, uh, hold on, 2,000 divided by uh, 10,000, it would be 0.2. You can also get that by saying one over five, the number of years one over the number of years, 0.2. If I multiply that times two, it's, there's the double declining rate, 40%. And if I take the 40% times the 10,000, I would of course get twice as much, 4,000. But then I use the half year convention, meaning I bought it in the middle of the year, divided by two, and that gets me back to the 2,000. That's where it gets a little messy. You could see that by going to the depreciation for the, the following year and you can see it's not straight line because if it was straight line that would still be the same dollar amount of 10,000 divided by five it's actually higher in the second year because in year two you got a full second year's worth of depreciation so so that's going to be uh that one and then we could we could select and say well what if i don't want that full amount so for example if i went to my schedule c and i say well what if for whatever reason, I don't want the full 2000 because maybe I think my my tax brackets will be higher next year because I'm gonna earn more money next year. So maybe I want to elect to take like the straight line method. So I could go over here and say, look, I wanna take the straight line method instead of, instead of the double declining. And so now it's at the 1000. So the 1000 I could see calculated down here. And that would simply be the straight line rate, which would be 10,000 divided by five, let's say would be 2,000 divided by two for the half year convention, 1,000 and in year, uh, the next year, now we've got 2,000, which you would expect because it's a full year of depreciation in year two versus one year in year three. So it would be 2,000 for the following years until the last year of depreciation where it would go back down to, to the 1,000 for the half year convention if you, if you held on to it for the life of the property. So now let's say it was seven year property. Let's imagine it was seven year property, which is here. So I'm going to go back to the double declining uh, for seven years, the normal makers office, office furniture and whatnot. And then if I go back on over, now I can see that uh, for 2022, let's say 2022, we've got, let's go down to the regular one again, 10,000 and and then it's only 500 being deducted so if i was to think about that if it was double declining if it was straight line it would be 10,000 divided by seven years would be that much 1,428 that's why seven years is a little bit more messy if i took that and divided by 10,000 i get to the 14.28 percent about which i can also get by taking one divided by the number of years seven that would be 14.28 percent about and then if I multiply that times two, I would get the double declining rate. And then I can multiply that times the 10,000. And that would be the amount for the first year if I didn't have a half year convention, but I have a half year convention. So I'm gonna take that and divide it by two. And I should get to that, but I didn't because I, got a st I, I put it on the straight line method, which I thought that looked low. Let's put this back on a seven year Let's put it on the seven year, not the straight line. Okay, so so now there we go. So there's the 1,429. Uh, and if I bring it back to the straight line, if I go back to the straight line for seven year and bring it back on over there, this was the seven year straight line. Okay, I think I had the complete wrong year there for a second. Sorry about that, 10,000 divided by seven would be that, divided by two for the half year convention would be that. So that would be the general, uh, the general idea.
Okay, let's take a look at this example where they, they do deal with the 179 real quick. So on Sandra and Frank Ellum, calendar year taxpayers bought, placed, uh, and serviced their business a new item. It's seven year property. It cost 39000 and they elected section 179 deduction of 24000 They also made an election under uh, 168K7 not to deduct special. So we got 179, but not special. Their unadjusted basis after the section 179 deduction is 15. So just to give you an idea of how that 179 kind of messes things up a bit here, let's just mirror that that uh, example. We're going to say it was on the books for for uh, 39,000, but we're going to have some 179 deduction. Now, again, in practice, oftentimes small businesses might take the full special or 179 deduction if they could, right? But as we go forward, we're going to get the concept concept of how the 179 deduction kind of fits in to this whole process. So you can see what basically happened here. If I said 24,000 is 179 deduction, what happened is the we've got the $39,000 cost. And then they said this is the current 179 deduction, which brings the basis down to uh, 15,000. And then they're calculating the makers and this in this case, straight line. Uh, let's let's change this to to non straight line seven year property makers. And so then they calculated the normal depreciation based on the adjusted basis now, which is the 15,000. So in other words, you might think that the 179 they should calculate as basically depreciation, but they kind of calculate it as adjusting the basis, right? If I look at what happens on the schedule C, then we're going to see that the full amount of the 26,144 is here. That is going to be, if I go back on over the 179 that was taken, 24,000 plus the 2,144, 26,144. Uh, so there we get the 26,144. So obviously the 179 is substantial because it's taking these big equipment that usually we would depreciate under normal accounting and and uh, taking it in year one. But it's it's kind of important to note how they basically account for it for adjusting the basis here. Now let's just look at this this worksheet real quick so we can kind of apply this out to what we're doing in the actual software. So this is be, the maker system that we're using. Usually we're defaulting to the GDS maker system that applies based on the property class, which is which we're going to determine based on the type. So if it's equipment, five or seven years, usually defaulting to the GDS, as we saw. The, rec the recovery period will be determined by the class of the property. Typically, the method and convention will be determined, you know, by by the what we selected prior to that. If we purchased a lot of stuff at the end of the year, we might have a mid quarter convention instead of half year and the depreciation rate here. So then the calculation, as we saw, kind of the cost or basis is up top. The business investment, meaning we could have some that's that was personal and business use. But if it's fully business use, then it would be here. Then you can see we deducted the 179 deduction to get to the subtotal, deducting the special deduction to get to that subtotal, and then we calculate the depreciation. Okay, let's take a look at another example. You bought office furniture, seven year property for 10,000 and placed it in service August 11, 2022. You use furniture only for, a bit. by the way, that last example, we were just kind of thinking about the basis calculation with it to get to that to get to that 15,000 to see how the 179 works. Okay. So this so this is the only property you placed in service this year. You did not elect 179 deduction. The property is not qualified property for purposes of claiming a special depreciation allowance. So the property's unadjusted basis is 10,000. So you use GDS and the half year convention to figure your depreciation. You refer to the maker's percentage table guide in appendix A to find it, okay? And so if I go back on over here, here's basically our worksheet. So let's plug this into uh, our our system. So it was, what was it? Seven year property, 10,000. And we put it on the books on, uh, when did, on 8, 11, 22. So we're gonna say, okay, so if I do, and then I'm not gonna have any 179, take that out, delete that. 
Okay. So I've got the 10,000 data input and we pull that we pull that over. Now obviously the the system will do the calculation. Let's just check the check what it does compared to the to the problem here. So 10,000 uh, cost. We've got the depreciation here. It's going to be the double declining half year convention and the life is the seven years. So the rate then it's using is that 0.1429. Uh, so if I can compare that to the table here, the maker system, it's the GDS, that's the default system, property class, seven year, because that's the type of property we put on there, which was the furniture, date placed in service, 811, seven year property based on the class, that the method being used 200% double uh, declining or double balance half year convention, and then there's the rate. So we took the 10,000, it's not personal use, all business 100%, 10,000 is the basis, no 179, no special, and then we just multiply it times the rate. So notice these tables can be useful because if I look at the rest of the tables, then it'll calculate and project out into the future. Notice that if I look at my software, I'm somewhat limited because I can go to, I can go to the depreciation for the next year here, and I can see what's going to happen next year. And, and that's great because I can tie that out if I work this out for the tables. But usually the, the tax software is geared towards calculating the current year and projections to make your estimated payments in the following year. So, so you might not have as much information on the, on the rest of the items. So these tables can be useful to like to, to project out further than one year into the future. And then you can use the software to kind of double check as we've seen here, years one and two, right? So there's the 2449 for year two, there's the 2449 uh, for year two. All right, let's do another one. You bought a building this time and land for 120,000 and placed it in service on March 8th. The sales contract shows that the building cost 100,000 and the land cost 20,000. So we're going to put the building is the depreciable part. So it is non-residential real property. The building's unadjusted basis is uh, its original cost, 100,000. So the maker refers to maker's percentage table. Okay, so March 3rd. So the multiply the builder's percent. Okay, so, so now we're going to put this on the books, non-residential real property. So I'm going to go back on over. Now we're dealing with, in essence, real estate or something. I'm going to say building. We might want the address and of course be more specific than just saying building in practice, but we're gonna say it's in the category of building and we have a mid month convention. So it's gonna make a difference to make sure we put the proper month in here. The amount is gonna be 100,000 for the building, not including the land and the method is gonna be, and you can see the methods are kind of listed out oftentimes in software. So we're looking at the, the real estate and this is the non-residential. So you've got the 31.5, uh, 39 straight line non-residential real property. So I'm gonna say, all right, that's the one and let's go back on over. And so now we've got our calculation of, of the 100,000. It's gonna be the straight line mid month uh, 39 is the life and there's the rate now if i compare that to the tables again i can see if i used the tables i'd have to find the table with the right month to get all the percentages uh correct but there's the there's the uh the rate and the 2033 i can kind of compare the first two calculations in my software because the software is designed to project a year into the future typically so there's the two two five six four in year two, two, five, six, four. You can also try to calculate these, you know, in Excel. You can do the actual uh, double declining method calculation, but it does get a little bit more messy because you have to flip the straight line after the straight line is higher and so on. But you can get a pretty good, easy estimate by, you know, putting in, doing the calculations in Excel. Let's do that mid-month convention in Excel just to test it out. So if I said, if I said, for example, the cost was 100,000 for just the building. The years, uh, I'm gonna say years is gonna be 39 years. If it was straight line, then the DPRE per year for an entire year, not given the partial year in the first year, 100,000 divided by 39 is gonna be that amount. And then we've got the, the partial depreciation, which we can do a couple different ways because we have a mid month convention. So we purchased it in the middle of uh, March. So I could say, okay, well, when I purchased 
the month of purchase purchase I could say is Jan is uh, is uh, January and February two full months plus a half month because I purchased it in the middle of March so it'd be like 2.5 let's add a decimal on that one and, and I could then think well I could divide that by 12 let's do it this way first I could take that and divide by months in year which are 12 and I'm gonna put an underline here and then divide that out so the fraction that we didn't depreciate be would be because these are the two months before it was on the books that I wasn't depreciating could but subtract that amount out it's gonna be 2.5 divided by 12 and let's make that a percent add some decimals so that means if I multiply this out this is the depreciation I'm not gonna get which would be this times this. So that's the amount of depreciation that isn't, I need to pull out of this one. So I'm going to say this is going to be this minus this. And there's the 2030, which is slightly different than over here because we didn't use the tables to do this. We did it uh, a calculation. Now, the other way you could do it is you might say, okay, let's think about the months in a year are 12. And then, so the month, of purchase is 2.5 given the mid-month convention. So if I subtract those two out, subtracting them this time, I, I'm gonna say 9.5 is the number of months that I should get credit for, for uh, the depreciation, because I'm, I'm, I'm depreciating for uh, 9.5 months in essence. So then I can compare that to the, to the fraction, 9.5 divided by the 12. Let's make that a percent add some decimals and then I can multiply this depreciation for the year times this right and I get to that same uh, 2033 this way so so a couple different ways you can you just using you're trying to find that fraction of a year including you know the mid-month convention